good a very good morning to you all and welcome to this AHDB webinar, which today focuses on the workings of the WIT Centre at NIAB EMR, a demonstration centre for precision technology in soft fruit. This morning we'll be hearing from some of the funders of the centre to learn more about the technological inputs and we'll be learning more about the current work programme and demonstrations of best practice. I'm Scott Raffle from the AHDB and I'll be chairing this morning's webinar. So, uh, a few housekeeping me measures to begin with. Uh, all of you are muted, so those of you who are watching or listening to the webinar are muted. You hopefully can hear and see us, we can't hear you. Uh, but don't worry, you will have the opportunity to ask some questions, which I'll explain shortly. In terms of the time of the webinar this morning, we'll be running for about an hour, so we'll be hoping to, hoping to finish round about 11 o'clock this morning. The webinar will be recorded, so for those who haven't been able to uh, view or live this morning, uh, there will be an opportunity for them to listen in later on, probably in about a week's time when the webinar will be uploaded to our website. For any of you who have enjoyed it that much, you can also uh, <coughs> listen and watch again. Uh, my colleagues at AHDB uh, have applied for basis and Neuroso points, so I'll say a little bit about that in a, in a second. So, because you are muted, uh, don't worry, you will be able to ask uh, questions. So, so, how can you uh, ask those questions? Well, uh, we have a little mock-up here of uh, your toolbar uh, at home or in the office. And, and if you have a look at that toolbar on the right-hand side, you will see some grey bars. Uh, and there is a, a bar for questions. So, if you can see uh, my mouse there, um, you can click on the down arrow for questions. You can type in your question, submit it, uh, that should be delivered to me, and I'll be able to, to uh, pose those questions to our presenters uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the conclusion of their presentation. I, I also mentioned basis and Eroso uh, points. We've applied for those. And also on your uh, toolbar, you will see another grey bar, which says handouts. And if you click on the handouts bar, you will then see uh, our application sheet for basis points for this particular event. Um, I would encourage you to fill that in during the webinar uh, with your basis registration number and your name and details and submit it during the webinar. If you don't have time or you haven't done it during the webinar, don't worry, you can send your details uh, to me uh, on email after the event and I can uh, share those with my colleagues. As I mentioned just now, uh, the webinar will uh, be recorded and, of course, you will be able to watch it probably in about a week's time. There is an HDB archive page where you can watch that, and I'll say a little bit more about that at the very end of the presentation. So, a little bit more about AHDB and the WET Centre. Well, um, we are just one of a number of partners uh, of the WET Centre, AHDB. There are five others. There are Berry Gardens, Coco Green, Delta T, Netifim UK uh, and Stoller Europe. Now, some of those funders uh, will be talking today and they'll be presenting information about uh, what they bring to the WET Centre in terms of technology and how that benefits the WET Centre. So we'll hear a little bit about that from them today, as well as more details from Mark Els about the workings of the WET Centre. Um, why are AHDB involved, you may ask? Well, uh, that's very simple. For some years, AHDB funded Mark Els uh, and his team of plant physiologists at NIA BMR to do research on water use efficiency, both in soil and container grown soft fruit crops. Uh, Mark was also funded by a number of other projects, IUK and other funders, and uh, he's discovered a whole range of technologies which help us to save water use and fertilizer use in soft fruit crops. So back in 2017, NIA BMR took a very bold step to set up the wet centre uh, as, a, as a best practice demonstration centre. The purpose really is uh, to, to demonstrate to growers and the industry what can be achieved and with the hope and the aspiration that growers and uh, businesses, soft fruit growing businesses will adopt this technology. AHDB's involvement is here really to help to disseminate the results from the wet centre and to promote the results in the technology so we can encourage and enhance the uptake of the technology. 
So on to the programme itself. What have we got this morning? I mentioned we have three of our part funders this morning. We have Netta from UK, Delta T and Stoller Europe, who are all going to explain to us what they bring to the wet centre. And then we'll have Mark else later on uh, in the meat of the subject, the meat of the topic, which is telling us all about the working of the program, the working program uh, and the ongoing uh, information that's coming from it in 2020. So let's kick off with Netifim UK. We have Robert Mitchell and Julian Gruselli standing by. So I invite Robert to explain to us what Netifim brings to the, uh, to the centre. Robert. Good morning. Thank you, Scott. Hopefully you will all see my, uh, my screen. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Robert Mitchell. I'm the managing director for Netifim here in the UK. And this morning, together with my colleague Julian Gozelli, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Netifim and importantly, why we are very much committed to the programme at the Wet Centre. Uh, I will start by introducing Netifim, giving some background as to why we're participating. Julian will then move on to talk more about the actual technology we've incorporated into the Wet Centre. And later in the webinar, Mark Els from the IBMR will be giving some uh, feedback on the achievements to date and future plans for what we might want to do next. Uh, at the end of this sort of short session, we will be available for some questions. So if you've got anything that I don't cover, please uh, ask at that time. Um, Netafim are a uh, part of the Orbia group of companies. We started as a desert kibbutz 55 years ago in the south of Israel and of course in trying to grow crops in such a harsh extreme environment we developed techniques for uh, irrigation, notably drip irrigation. And in the years that followed that Netifim grew to be one of the biggest irrigation companies in the world. We are selling products in around 110 countries. But at the heart, Netifim is still the same company. We are still looking at innovative ways in order to grow more with less. And those that know Netifim will know grow more with less is very much our catchphrase. But it's much more than that. It's really a commitment. It's really our reason for being. So why is that? Well, the world's need for food is growing fast. Within 30 years, there'll be 10 billion of us on the planet and we'll need 60% more food than we have today. But we're not particularly good with our resources. If we do nothing, we will have 25% less water than we need and 4 billion people in the world will be living in areas of severe water stress. At the same time, we'll be trying to grow food for the planet on 20% less arable land per person than we have today. This is only in 30 years time. So what can we do? Well, we need to find a way. We need to find a way to grow more food, to use less water and to do so on the land that we already have. We believe at Netafin that precision irrigation is the right way forward. What is precision irrigation? Well, it's the ability to nourish the plant, not the soil, to feed the plant at the roots, to deliver water and fertilizers when it's needed, where it's needed. And this we believe and can demonstrate will allow farmers to grow higher and better yields in a more sustainable way. But at the same time, putting less in, less fertilizers, less water, less energy, etc. And this is the uh, reason why we are very much committed to the wet centre, because we believe together with our partners, we can actually achieve ways of growing more with less and not only achieve those ways, but demonstrate. We believe we can increase uniformity and product quality. In essence, what we're trying to do is ensure that every plant on the farm is as good as the best plant on the farm. And we want to try to maximize the output from every square meter of available land. We want to do that whilst putting in less energy, less fertilizers and less other inputs such as pesticides and herbicides. And we want to use less labor to do that and less management time and of course less water and we believe together with our partners at Naya BMR and the other partners in the wet center we can not only find ways to do this in the best possible way but can use the wet center as a demonstration facility to share that knowledge and ensure that we do meet the objective of feeding the world in 30 years time what I want to do now is hand over to Julian, who will talk more specifically about the technology we've incorporated 
into the wet centre. Julian. Good morning. I'm Julian Griselia. I'm a Chief Technical Officer for Netafim UK. Um, in September, we installed a uh, Netajet Okta in the wet centre. Uh, this is an advanced dosing system that uses analog dosing valves. With a conventional dosing system, you have what valves that we would describe as digital. The valve opens to allow fertilizer in or to allow acid in, and then closes once the set point is exceeded. Once it um, drops below the set point, the valve opens again. And you can see this in the table on the right hand side. The orange line shows the way a traditional conventional unit would work and the blue line shows the way a, an analog unit would work. And what we see with the analog is that we've got a far more consistent um, injection of fertilizer as the analog valve is open all the time and that leads to a, a more homogeneous solution um, in, the, uh, in the irrigation system. But traditionally systems have all been governed by EC and EC is a, a very blunt tool and really it's a measure of toxicity, it's not a measure of fertilizer use. Now we can understand fertilizer use, we can send the, the runoff to a lab and we can get the results and that can take some days so the crop has moved on by the time we actually know what it's using. East Morling have for about three years now been developing nutrient sensing technology with other partners to allow the specific nutrients being used by the crop to be uh, measured and then we can add those back in the irrigation and this is why we installed the OCTA, the eight channel dosing system in the wet center because the aim is to inject straights rather than traditional A and B compound mixes that we're currently using. And Mark will cover a little bit more of this later on in his presentation. Now, whilst the dosing system is something that we all understand as technology, the real precision engineering is in the drippers. So if Robert can go to the next slide, please. There we go. In Netavim, we make around 320 million of our PCJ drippers a year. About 20% of these will come into the UK and into Holland, and they're used in all forms of uh, substrate growing. The purpose of, of a dripper, of any dripper, is to take the water at pressure and to actually make it drip in a controlled manner. Um, the inlet of the dripper on the PCJ provides some protection against any debris in the pipe, but the most important part is the labyrinth. This is the part that actually removes the energy from the water and makes it drip. And it's the, the focus of R&D and it's precision engineered to be resistant to blockage for, for many years to come. That's combined with a chemical resistant diaphragm that both regulates the output and closes the dripper at the end of the irrigation. I mean, this feature allows us to do the short pulses without draining the system down. I mean, our drippers also have a self-cleaning fun function, so any debris that gets through the drippers is automatically flushed out. But uh, having the world's most trusted dripper is uh, not enough. We need to maintain it. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So. We've been working with East Morling now for, for over 10 years and we've done a lot of um, on-farm testing and we've seen that there's considerable variability in irrigation systems across the UK. Now this variability can be caused by system design, it can be caused by product selection, maintenance, lack of maintenance or just old age. If irrigation is not uniform, I mean, that's going to impact the grower's ability to achieve maximum yields and optimum quality. And through the wet center, we have developed a, an audit protocol that can be used by growers to allow them to understand that variability in their irrigation system if they have it, and where to focus any remedial action that may be needed. All of this can be um, reached by growers by approaching the uh, wet center. But that's the end of our short Netafim presentation. So it's back to Scott. Robert, Julian, thank you very much. Stand by. A uh, couple of questions for you, which uh, I'm sure you'd be happy to answer. Um, you mentioned about oct the Octajet rig. How can growers improve the uniformity of their drip irrigation system? 
And uniformity is is not just about the technology. As I said, the most important part is the 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 dripper. Um, and there are many things that that go into maintaining the uniformity. Filtration is a big part. Actually, presenting the dripper with um, water quality that's appropriate to uh, to the dripper's lifespan. Um, and if we can maintain the dripper and keep the dripper in good condition, we can deliver water to the roots precisely um, through the through the lifespan of the crop. Okay, thank you. I, I think just just to add, Scott, I think it's it's very much worthwhile um, remembering what Julian said about water audits and irrigation audits. I think that um, increasing the frequency of irrigation audits uh, and uh, adapting and maintaining according to the outcome will very much improve the uniformity across the farm and will ensure that you really are getting the best out of the out of the crop. OK, good advice from the experts, I would say. Uh, one other question. Um, for many years, growers, a lot of growers have used uh, compound feeds and bespoke feeds and so on. Question here about straight feeds. Is fertigation using straight feeds going to become the norm for soft fruit growers? Who wants to answer that one? Julian? I'll make a start. I mean, Yes, I think so. I think it's, you know, we, we talk about grow more with less. We know that um, fertilizer across the world is becoming in short supply. And so we need to use it more efficiently. And if we can actually understand the bits that the food, the, the, the crop wants, that we can give those precisely and one, have a better crop response, but two, actually use our, our natural resources um, more frugally, shall I say. So, yes, I think over the, the years to come, we will see it, it becoming far more the uh, mainstream. OK, yeah. thank you. Uh, Robert? No, just to add, I think I think the other point is you're giving the plant exactly what it wants and, and nothing more. And I think in, in over-fertilising, etc., in order to ensure the plant gets what it wants, you're then introducing you know, um, impacts on the environment in the watercourse, et cetera. So, you know, moving to straights and ensuring the plants are just getting exactly what is needed um, will obviously have a consequent a positive effect on the environment. OK, we must move on. Robert, Julian, thank you so much for your time and for your presentation this morning. Um, just a reminder to all of you out there, if you have questions during these presentations, do submit them via the question bar on the on your toolbar on the right hand side of hopefully the right hand side of your screen. We're going to move on to Delta T. Uh, Delta T, another of our funders, part funders for the wet centre. And uh, John Newstead from Delta T is standing by to explain what Delta T brings in terms of technology to the wet centre. John, good morning to you. Uh, good morning, Scott. Hopefully you can all hear and see me. Um, if not, let me know. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is John Newstead. I'm, the, I'm a soil and environmental scientist at Delta T Devices. Uh, a little bit of background on Delta T, I think. Um, we design or have been designing and manufacturing our own range of uh, environmental monitoring uh, equipment uh, for 50 years. In fact, I think this year or next year is actually our 50th year. Um, we have been involved in the WET Centre since the start. Um, it's an important association for us. Um, it allows us to showcase our equipment, but more importantly, it allows us to showcase the value that equipment can provide uh, to the soft fruit market, to any particular grower in a commercial and applied setting. Um, that's quite important to us. So what kind of equipment does Delta T supply to the wet centre? Let me just move the screen down. Um, first of all, we have GP2 data logger, a variety of uh, input channel types, um, a variety of relays are available. Uh, relays are important because they allow you to action an external function based on an input to the logger. And I'll give an example of that in just a moment. It has a script editor, which uh, to you and me means it's programmable. So if you have an environmental parameter that can be described with an algorithm, then it can be put on the GP2. Examples would be disease prediction, um, ET, uh, particularly say Penman Monte, that's a very complex equation, uh, dew point, anything that can be described mathematically. Um, it's proved itself to be um, highly flexible and adaptable. Next on my list, um, many of you may be familiar with, is the wet kit a multi-parameter sensor, um, such as substrate moisture, EC, and temperature. 
Um, it's a real workhorse for us, seems to sell very well. It's, it's got a really nice ergonomic design. But what's really unique about that is the fact that the temperature sensor is towards the base of the central pin. So you're getting a really good uh, temperature reading uh, from the root zone. Moving on, we have our SM150T buried soil moisture and temperature sensor. Uh, it's proven, been around for a while, established, reliable, and because of that, we give it a five year warranty, which we think is quite important. You've got to remember you're working in quite an aggressive environment. And then um, Paul Cutton in this uh, uh, presentation would be the QS5 PAR sensor. I'm not actually going to say much about that, um, time is short, but Mark is going to be giving uh, a lot more detail about um, all his latest research in um, uh, light through polytunnels and the effects that has on growth. So um, uh, if we stay tuned for Mark's talking about 15, 20 minutes. So these um, are all about measuring, monitoring and controlling. The other part that Delta T offers to the wet center is visualization. So the GP2 um, sends data via a modem to the cloud, known as Delta Link Cloud. If you bought some equipment, it's a free website, so there's no annual subscription to it. Um, but we do recognize that your data, a grower's data, it's unique, it's dynamic, it's constantly changing. It has a lot of value to it. And because of that, we offer a very secure um, server for our, our website. In fact, we have multiple servers uh, to cater for that. But we don't always want to look at data that's uh, time series data that's showing variations in the property over the last two or three months. We often want to have it um, you know, now, what's happening right now. And so, of course, Delta have our dashboards. They're a, uh, an add-on extra. Um, get your live, live stream data at your fingertips. Um, and obviously, you can display that on tablets, phones, TVs, um, laptops, whatever. But we'd like to think that the cloud site and the dashboards are really clear, have a very clear, very simple layout. You want to be able to see what's happening without too much of a struggle. So the dashboards, we don't think are particularly busy. They're nice and pretty straightforward what they're telling you. But it's, it's important to note that that data looks very precise on a dashboard or any visualization, any, anything that comes up on your, any graph, it always looks very precise. But how accurate is it? And so at Delta T, uh, we'd like to think we provide that reliability and that accuracy with our sensors that gives your data and your graphics that little bit of extra robustness, a little bit of extra trust. So it's great that you've got precise data, but make sure it's accurate by getting good quality sensors. So moving on, a uh, quick example of what the GP2 can do in a, a, a controlling setting. So this is a polytunnel um, at the back of Delta T using raspberries. If you look at the air temperature curve, which is the third one down, when the air temperature rises in the morning, reaches 25 degrees, the GP2 switches on an extractor fan. This removes the moist air from the polytunnel, so the relative humidity plummets, and at the same time, the vapor pressure deficit, the VPD, rises. VPD is a real driver for transpiration from plants. And if you look at the top curve, the substrate moisture content, you can see that 15 to 20 minutes after um, the extractor fan has been switched on, there was a drop in moisture content. And this is the plant starting to transpire. It's then drawing moisture up through the uh, uh, substrate. And so you can see the moisture content dropping. It reaches a lower threshold value and an irrigation sequence is switched on with upper and lower thresholds. And you can see that classic sawtooth pattern. So in this particular example, we've got a GP2 that's just doing some simple monitoring and, and visualization. You've got a GP2 that's controlling operations um, of a fan according to predefined environmental conditions. Uh, the GP2 in this case is also controlling the irrigation. And we're forcing a physiological response from the plants perhaps earlier on in the day than might have happened naturally. So perhaps I'll keep looking at the wet center itself. Um, top picture there. Hopefully you've you still got uh, the feed. Um, top picture shows a very neatly wired up GP2. Uh, bottom picture, if you had x-ray vision, you'd see a really nice, neatly uh, installed uh, SM150T in the side of a Koya bag there. And to the left, you've got a schematic which shows the, the, the whole setup. Um, it shows five SM150T sensors. There are actually six in the, in per logger. Uh, that data is being averaged. The GP2 is saying when to irrigate and how much to irrigate. And that information has been sent to the Netafim uh, irrigation controllers and system. 
The data is also being sent up to Delta Link Cloud for our visualization so that we can manage what's going on. And I believe that's uh, all from Delta T devices. If there are any questions, uh, please do ask now or um, please do email me. Thank you. John, thank you so much uh, for, for all of that helpful information. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, oh, yes, we're going to work you hard. How sensitive are your sensors, sensors to temperature extremes or to di diurnal fluctuations and how reliable are they? Uh, well, they prove very robust and reliable, which is why we offer the five-year warranty on it. In terms of, temp terms of temperature fluctuations, that we we uh, operate uh, uh, an algorithm for temperature correction, which is operated at the uh, uh, wet centre, uh, which means the data is pretty accurate. Yes, and that's an important okay. point to have accurate data. So that algorithm itself, I think, was developed a few years back um, uh, here at Delta T and for an RUK project with uh, East Morling. OK, thank you. Uh, another one here. Um, how close are you to developing wireless sensors for use by growers? <laughs> OK, wireless. Yes, we are doing a wireless, our own wireless uh, system, uh, node based system. Um, should be ready hopefully by the end of this year. And we are obviously hoping that uh, we'll have it uh, for show um, next season in the wet centre. OK, so, yes, so, it's coming. It's coming. Good, it's very important good, good to that. Something for us to look forward to, and maybe, maybe, just maybe, if we're all able to get out together as a group next year, we'll be able to have a look at those uh, in action at the Wet Centre. John, thank you so much thank for your you. time this morning. Really appreciate it. Okay, so we, thank you. We're going to move on now to our third uh, funder this morning. Uh, this is Stoller Europe, and I'm going to welcome Antonio Lorente. Now, Antonio is possibly known to many of you uh, because he used to work at NIA BMR in Mark Els's, uh plant physiology team. He did his PhD there. Uh, and uh, he actually, most importantly, was uh, instrumental in setting up the very wet center that we're talking about this morning. But Antonio now works for Stoller and Antonio is gonna tell us all about what you can uh, provide to the wet center, Antonio. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, my my name is Antonio. I'm uh, I'm, uh, I'm now area manager for Stoller in in the UK, and I'm gonna be showing uh, showing you some or giving you some information about uh, Stoller, the company, and what we are going to do in the wet center and why. So, first, an overview of the company. Stoller is, a, is an American company with headquarters in Houston, Texas, and, um, and that it, it is actually uh, selling its products in around 50, in about 50 countries. Um, in the, the the products that we sell are are in in Europe and in the UK are easy fertilizers that are applied. Uh, via sprays or in, in case of the soft fruit via uh, drip irrigation. We are in the wet center because we want to demonstrate our commitment with the UK industry, especially these days. Uh, we want to show the performance of our, of our technologies in uh, UK conditions. We want to demonstrate our commitment to innovation as well. We want to integrate our solutions with current best-in-class practices. We also want to participate in a forum of UK soft fruit experts, and we want to bring in experiences from around the world as well. I want to give you today two examples of what our technologies can do. First, I want to talk about how we can optimize the levels of the endogenous uh, growth hormones. These are uh, cytokinins, auxins, and gibberellic acid. And secondly, I want to talk to you about how we can reduce the levels of uh, internal ethylene and the effects that that can have on the plant. So talking about example number one, uh, we what it, what it does, what this technology can do, is to optimize the level of the main growth hormones, auxin, cytokinins, and gibberellins, that will keep the plant active and doing what it's meant to do at the right time. It will shield the plant against microstressors, 
and will help to achieve the maximum production potential. We have some experience already in the UK in farm uh, in 2018 and 2019, where we managed to get good grower and advisor feedback. There was some uh, there was successful experiences in Kent, in Hereford, and also in Scotland, and we targeted ever better strawberry crops. Uh, in, we we managed to achieve higher yields up to 250 grams per plant more less waste we reduce picking costs from six to ten pence per kilo uh, we achieve a timely production uh, which it is it is especially critical in scotland as many of you know and uh, also we help to recover planted from stress better than seaweeds and amino acids combined. We are testing this solution or demonstrating this solution in the wet center in 2020. So it's an, 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 it is an ongoing experience at the moment. Regarding example number two, uh, what we do there is to reduce excessive ethylene production during the stress conditions. We relieve the plant and help it to recover after stress. We can extend the harvesting window and avoid unnecessary yield losses. Right, we have this independent trial to show you where, and what I want to, to, to say here is that, right, this is an independent trial. It's a replicated trial on a June bearer crop. And what you are seeing here is first class fruit and firmness of this fruit. The main learning from here is that limiting the stress brings more yield towards the end of the cycle. There. Simply because the plant is more active, we limit the stress, it's stronger at the end of the cycle. But more importantly, firmness is improved during the cycle of the plant, irrespectively of the crop load. This technology will be demonstrated at the West Center in 2021. And that's it. That's my presentation today. I have my contact details in the first slide. So if you have any, any question, please, please ask now or contact me and I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Antonio. Um, right, yes, we have a, a couple of questions here for you, uh, if you're standing by for these. Um, one question here is, given that Stoller products help plants to recover from less favourable environments, such as stress, um, what results do you expect to get from the wet centre? Well, talking with Mark, um, he mentioned that the leg rows tend to have uh, less yield. So a positive outcome of the experience this year would be uh, seeing that the, these leg rows are actually matching yields of the central rows. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Um, and a second question here is you spoke about your uh, EthiDrive product. Uh, it seems to interfere, interfere with the production of ethylene. Uh, this is an important ripening gas we know, for, for instance, in tree fruit production for apples. Uh, what role do you reckon it has in the ripening of soft fruit? Uh, yes, this is, a, this is a, common, a common question, whether, whether ethylene has a role in the ripening of, of soft fruit, the strawberries in particular, because um, the, the common belief is that it's not a climateric fruit, but actually there is a there is a misunderstanding about what the, the actual fruit in, in a strawberry is. The actual fruit in a strawberry is the akin, is the seed, what we know the we, we, we call the seed, and that actually has a behavior of a climateric fruit. So the role of ethylene in in, in a strawberry is is probably is higher than we than than some people think. Uh, it's, it's definitely the ripening and, and the stress and so on has a, a great effect on, on strawberries as well. 
Yeah. Okay. Tapping into your three years of uh, research as a PhD student there to answer that question. Thank you, Antonio. Mm. We need to move on. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I should you. say we have got another question here for, for John Newstead, but we'll uh, we'll take that at the end, John. If you're listening and you're standing by, we'll uh, bring you back in at the end uh, to, to answer that question. But I'd like to move on now to our final speaker, uh, Mark Els uh, from NIA BMR. Dr. Mark Els, plant physiologist, I think is known to most people in the industry. Uh, for those who have visited the wet centre in recent years, he's always the happy smiling face that you will see uh, greeting you on your arrival. Uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Scott, and good morning, everyone. Um, um, it's a great pleasure to uh, be able to contribute to the uh, to the webinar and just really to tell you about some of the um, uh, results that we've seen in the last couple of years and how those results have helped us to inform our research program for 2020. Uh, so just before I begin, I'd, I'd like to thank the contributions from our partners uh, uh, early this morning, but also to thank and acknowledge continued input and support from, from our partners, Berry Gardens and also Cocoa Green, and also to acknowledge Hutchinson's and, um, and uh, WeatherQuest, who are also associate members of the Wet Centre. <clears throat> So, as Robert said right at the very beginning, uh, given the challenges we face now and in the future, we're going to need to grow more with less. And so, well, what does that mean for the UK soft root industry? Well, it, it means uh, optimising yields per plant. And so every plant is as good as the best plant, as Julian said. That needs to be achieved with uh, efficient water use and fertiliser use. Um, we need to minimise the, um, uh, the, um, the emissions to land, air, and to water to make sure that these intensive growing systems uh, have a minimum impact on the environment. And of course, all of that needs to be achieved amongst uh, uh, significant challenges such as climate change and also the reduced availability of skilled labour. So what the Wet Centre partnership allows us to do is to uh, develop innovative solutions and then test them in a semi-commercial setting. And so we can begin to quantify uh, the level of benefits that we might be able to pass on to the growers from these innovative solutions. So um, for the second year now, we're growing uh, the variety Marling Champion at the Wet Centre. And you'll see here uh, along the top there, a couple of photographs going from flowering through to small green fruit, through to fruit ripening. So we're now just starting to, uh, to harvest berries from the second uh, second flush of trusses and so uh, we'll be happy to update you uh, later on in the season about how those plants have fared and what the results of some of the treatments that we've been testing this year are. Um, just along the bottom there you can see various uh, sensors and technology that we have installed in the wet centre this year. Um, so, so the one on the left hand side is the SMT150, uh, the Delta T moisture sensor and this just really is there to, to highlight the fact that if if we're going to use these sensors to generate accurate, uh, informative and reliable data, we need to make sure they're installed correctly. And so, of course, the Delta T sensor would normally be buried entirely within the coir in order to give us that accurate information. So you can see there we have new runoff stations that are able to collect runoff from all 50 metres of, of, um, of gutter. So we get very accurate runoff figures. Next along, you can perhaps see some of the PAR sensors that, that John mentioned earlier. Uh, I'll explain why we're using those in, in a few slides time. And also then the final slide is a weather station. So we can begin to monitor very closely temperature, humidity, vapor pressure deficit, and those variables that we know influence plant performance and crop productivity. So um, as John mentioned earlier, we're using the precision irrigation system at the wet center. And John has already covered uh, some of the basics of the system. Um, Many of you who have visited the wet centre in the past will know that, that we're able to uh, use that system to maintain the moisture content in the coir bags within a very narrow predetermined um, range. And you can see there the graph on the right hand side is a graph from a commercial grower site and one of the trials. And uh, the red line there is the, is the coir water content um, maintained by precision irrigation. And you can see there those peaks and troughs that sometimes occur in the grower um, irrigated plots. And we know then that that can perhaps sometimes reduce yield and also affect berry quality. 
And so an output from our, our work with our partners and our Innovate UK funding is this commercial offer, this commercial precision irrigation offer uh, that we refer to as the precision irrigation package. And this then allows growers to improve their on-farm water use efficiencies, but also their fertilizer use efficiencies and start to begin to optimize consistency of yield and quality across a growing area. Okay, so just a little bit about how that system uh, works. And so you'll see here a couple of examples from, from last year. If we look on the left-hand side first, you'll see there on the 4th of June. So the vapor pressure deficit, the blue line, was very, very low on the 4th of June. It was a very wet and rainy overcast day. And so the, the driving force of plant transpiration is very low. So the plants are using very little water. So you can see there in the bottom graph on the left-hand side, there's only one irrigation of plant one irrigation event needed to maintain uh, the, uh, the water content in the coir within that predetermined range. If then we flip to the 4th of July, you can see there the vapour pressure deficit rather than being around 0.1, as in the June example, the vapour pressure deficit now is up to four. So very hot day, uh, driving tra maximal transpiration. And as you can see there, then uh, the Delta T system kicks in and, and uh, in this case, uh, schedules 16 irrigation events. So even in that hot day, we're maintaining the moisture content within the coir within that very narrow predetermined limit. Of course, all this data again, as John mentioned, is available uh, via the grow dashboard. So we can see there the, the, um, the instantaneous moisture content within the coir. We then have a brief history of moisture content to see how that's varied over the last couple of days. And again, detailed information on runoff uh, and, and important variables like vapor pressure deficit, and of course, um, light levels. And so there's easy access to this real-time data via the dashboard, but also then access to far more detailed data on, on, on the cloud reports. So that's how the system works. That's how we maintain the moisture content within the coir and also the EC and the temperature within those predetermined limits. In addition to those continual measurements, then we take twice weekly spot measurements to understand the variability um, of, for example, moisture content or EC or temperature within the bags, within the different treatments, within the different growing areas of the wet center. And you'll see there in the photograph on the left, so um, Martin is using the Delta T wet sensor uh, to produce very detailed information about the moisture content, the EC and the temperature within those bags. And you'll see there, then we have various uh, sort of heat maps we can generate that give us lots of detailed information about the variability within the bag, but also the variability between bags in different rows of the wet center. Um, so this is just taken from a, from a day uh, last year in July. And you can see there, perhaps if you look on the extreme right-hand side, that's the temperature of the coir. You can see there on the west-hand side, as we go through purple to blue to green to red, the temperature of the coir is increasing. So the temperature of the rhizosphere is increasing on that west-hand side. That's in the center row. You can see a very different pattern, of course, in the, in the bag, in the, in the leg row. So this starts to highlight some of these differences we're picking up between leg rows and center rows that I'll come on to in a moment. So last year, we uh, tested a couple of treatments looking to see whether uh, maintaining runoff at a target value of 5% um, or 10% had any effect on fruit yields or fruit quality. And uh, I should say that the yields in those treatments were identical, but of course we use less water in the 5% uh, treatment. And then what that translates to then is a more efficient use of water. And often we express water use efficiency in terms of water productivity. And so um, in, in this example, liters of water used to produce a kilogram of, 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 of berries. And you'll see there that uh, obviously the value was slightly better in the 5% treatment compared to the 10% treatment. But those values around 30, 40, 45 are, are perhaps values we should all be aiming for as we, as we sort of strive to in, increase yields, but use those precious resources more efficiently. So this brings us really on to uh, the work we're doing at the moment in the wet center. So, so uh, these are just some of the research questions that we're, we're asking uh, uh, this year. I don't have time to go into detail in all of them. And so I'll quickly skip through the uh, the first five there in the uh, in the following slides. But do uh, keep checking the Wet Center website um, for updates and also the AHDB webpage. So you might remember from 2018 that we were testing uh, the, uh, the difference between 
white cocoa green bags and black cocoa green bags. And so with this uh, marling centenary crop we had in 2018, you'll remember it's a very hot, hot summer, very hot June and July. And what we saw was a, an overall 10% higher yields in, in, uh, in plants that were growing in the white bags compared to plants growing in the black bags. And uh, we know that this is not a positional effect. It's not due to where these bags were positioned in the wet center because we're able to randomize treatments and, and uh, account for that sort of uh, edge row effect. So there are, there's a very simple explanation perhaps for this is the fact, well, okay, do white bags reflect more light? And so um, I'll, I'll go on to, uh, uh, to show how important light is to, uh, to drive yields and berry quality. And so it may just be that those white bags reflect more more light and then help to raise photosynthesis and that's something we're measuring this year at the wet center it might also be then if you look to the graph on the on the right hand side you'll see there that the the rhizosphere temperature the temperature within those that coir bag the black bag was was up to four degrees higher during the daytime in uh, in in some cases over the 2018 growing season and also between a half a degree and a degree higher at night time as well and so we're interested to understand whether those higher temperatures drive increased root respiration rate and, and then whether that alters resource partitioning then and causes perhaps this, this difference in yields between those white and those black bags. And so uh, by the end of the season, we'll be able to have a more, um, a more definitive answer uh, about those effects. The, one of the great advantages of the wet centre is that our farm team can pick uh, individual rows or even individual half rows uh, very accurately. And so we get very accurate yield records from those different zones within, uh, um, within the growing area. So you can see here, um, you can see the, uh, the photograph, the, the row on the, on the left, row 18 is a leg row. And you can see then the photo, uh, the, um, row 16 is a, is a row in the centre. So even those two rows are perhaps you know, only two meters apart, the yield per plant in those rows is very different. And so if you look in the table on the, on the right hand side, you can see there the yield in row four, which in this case is, um, is um, row 16, we've got 796 grams per plant. And you can see there then compared to uh, the leg row, uh, which is row 18, 653 grams, so an 18% difference in yield uh, just between those two different growing positions. Now these were the same plants planted at the same time, given the same fertilizer, given the same water, um, and given the same pest and disease treatments, and so it begins to show the importance of those local phytoclimates, and by phytoclimate I mean the sort of environment around the, the roots, but also the environment around the leaves and the, and the fruit. And so as Antonio said, it'll be interesting to see uh, as we go later into the cropping season, whether the Stala products can help to support higher yields from those, uh, from those leg rows. But this is a significant effect. If we scale this up to a hectare of production, this 18% difference translates to nine tonnes per hectare difference in yield. And so coming back to what Julian said before, is we want to try to make every plant as good as the best plant. And so we're investigating uh, what it is about these different positions in the polytunnels that causes uh, those yield differences. As well as total yield differences, just data from 2018 that you may have seen already with Marling Centenary, again, the row position affects the timing of the, of the fruit ripening. So in any given time during any given harvest date, there could be differences of up to 40 to 50% in the, in, the, um, in the volume of ripe fruit that are picked from the leg rows compared to the center rows. And of course, taken together, this complicates the uh, uh, estimations of, of um, yields that growers have to make every week. And so there are lots of factors into playing here that, that make those predictions very difficult. And so we've just begun a, a, a new Innovate UK project that's led by Berry Gardens. And you can see there along the bottom our partners in, in that project. And this project really is focusing on trying to understand how we can optimize the fighter climate, how we can try to raise plant productivity to a high level across the whole of the growing season uh, and also to develop tools to help growers to predict those class one yields. So just really very briefly to talk about uh, light and photosynthesis, you'll see here uh, on the graph on the left hand side, this is uh, a, a well-known effect of light level on the rate of photosynthesis. So as light level, which is on the x-axis, increases, you'll see there that the rate of photosynthesis also increases 
up to a point that's called the light saturation point. And above this point, then a photosynthesis plateaus and there's no further increase in photosynthesis. But clearly what you can see from that graph then is that light levels below the saturation point have a significant effect on, on the rate of photosynthesis. And of course, photosynthesis is important in driving the production of sugars uh, and, and flavor compounds and secondary metabolites. And so if we begin to investigate a little more carefully the, the light that's reaching those plants in those different rows, and you'll see here data from, from the 28th of March this year. So if we concentrate on, for example, row one to begin with, which is the light blue color, you'll see their light rises early in the morning. Row one is on the east of the polytunnel, so that's what we'd expect. So light rises to a maximum and then begins to fall off after midday to a fairly low level. And you'll see that the converse is true for row six, which is sort of the pinky colored um, um, symbols. So again, their light is low in the morning and rises to a peak in the afternoon and then decreases into the evening. And so, so you can see there, even in that sort of 8.5 meter wide polytunnel, there's a very different lighting environment uh, in the different rows. Um, and you'll see that, that uh, the hashed line there. So, so that's um, that's just assuming a light saturation point for this variety of of a value of 1,000. And so, what we can do for each day then is we can calculate the number of hours where the light level is above that threshold of 1,000. And if we if we do that on any given day, and you'll see there on the table on the left hand side, you'll see there row four has has um, on that particular day had over seven hours of of um, of light when the light was above the threshold. Whereas you look at row one and row one just had five hours where uh, the light was above that threshold level. And those light levels then correlate very closely to the yields that we saw from the wet center last year. So you'll see there higher light levels translate to higher yields. And that's something we want to uh, investigate further this year. One of the uh, ambitions of the new project, of course, is to develop smart venting control to try to, to try to provide more light into those leg rows. And you can see here a graph, um, again, taken uh, fairly recently towards the end of June. Now you can see data there. By uh, operating the smart venting control, we can increase light into those leg rows. So, so row one and two, are the light levels are increased in the morning. And, and row six and row five and row four, the light levels can be increased in the afternoon. And so that's one of the, the, the objectives of the project is to develop um, um, intelligent smart venting control to be able to optimize the growing environment um, in, in those different areas within the polytunnel. So time's moving on. I'll just quickly mention a couple of projects that we're doing on Raspberry at the moment. And again, this is involving uh, partners in two Innovate UK projects. So the first involves our partners environmental monitoring solutions, again, in a project led by Berry Gardens. And, and this is really trying to understand, I think as Julian mentioned earlier, how we can begin to match demand with supply in terms of, of um, fertilizers. So um, we have growing, we're growing Marling Charm and Marling Bella at the wet center uh, in, in the new raspberry tunnels. As Julian mentioned, uh, we installed an eight channel um, um, rig in the wet center um, last September and we hope to be able to install a real-time NPK sensor in the wet center um, this month in, in order to be able to demonstrate what we're trying to achieve in terms of real-time um, sensing of the availability of uh, for example nitrogen and potassium and phosphorus. So uh, the next step really is to really try to incorporate those different elements so precision dosing uh, this ability to monitor the levels of NPK that are available in the COIA in real time and combine those two elements with, uh, with nitrogen demand models that are variety specific. And so you'll see there the graph at the top there. And uh, we're developing models to help us understand how the crop demand for nitrogen changes during the growing season. And what we hope to do in this, in this new project that will start uh, next month is to combine those different elements to develop a closed loop fertigation system that continually adjusts the N and the P and the K to match the needs of the growing crop throughout the growing season. So very much moving away from the EC-based um, EC based decisions that we're having to make now. So uh, that's really just an overview of some of the work we're doing at the wet centre. Uh, just before I hand back to Scott, I'd like to thank my 
my team in my department and also the farm team at East Marling for the great job they're doing at the wet centre. And also thanks to Scott and Maya for organising and running this, this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, hang around because there are a few questions for you. Um, let's take them in turn. Um, somebody's asked the question, you're monitoring many parameters. Is there any scope or thoughts about mapping these to disease incidents and the severity uh, and for greater precision of pesticides? Um, well, I know you can answer that question regarding powdery mildew, I think, can't you? Yes, we can. And so obviously we're collecting lots of data that's, that's relevant to all sorts of things. And of course, um, and as Scott mentioned, an easy example is powdery mildew. And so, so we know the critical vapor pressure deficit uh, periods or points at which um, you know, powdery mildew can become a problem. And so by understanding or by measuring uh, the current vapor pressure deficit and combining that data with perhaps forecasted vapor pressure deficit uh, that we're likely to see inside the polytunnels, we can, uh, we can provide a daily risk, but also then we can provide a, provide a risk profile over the next sort of uh, four to five days. And that, that's part of the work that's started last year in the wet centre and is being progressed this year in the wet centre. So, so yes, these, these, these measurements that we're making have, have um, you know, are beneficial to lots of different, uh, um, for lots of different purposes. Good. OK, thank you. Um, another question. Um, we talked about auto venting tunnels um, and all the high tech stuff that we've got at the wet centre. Somebody wants to know um, how can growers without auto venting tunnels benefit from the work at the wet centre? Yeah, that's a very good question. Not everybody has, obviously, the auto vented tunnels. And while they provide lots of flexibility, it's important that we also provide um, advice and outputs that all of the growers can use. So, so as a simple answer would be to uh, to perhaps regularly change plastic. Um, um, and we know the quality of the plastic, the film degrades over time. And so keeping an eye on, 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 on the sort of the rate of deterioration and changing the plastic, making sure the plastic's clean. Um, we have a lot of dust blowing around in the wet center, for example, and, and that then eventually settles on the roof. So trying to Try to minimise the possibility of dust blowing onto the plastic in, in your growing areas. Um, understanding how to improve, how we can improve uh, light interception in those suboptimal rows, and perhaps also choosing varieties that we know perform perhaps uh, they perform better under low light levels. And so um, there is a combination of different things that um, that growers can do to help to help really drive photosynthesis. Then in order to be able to maximize yields and quality. Okay, thank you. One final one for you, Mark. Um, there are various different types of tunnels, uh, structures and so on. Some businesses use the Cravo system. Um, given the light seems to be so important for high and consistent yields and quality, why are we not using a Cravo system at the wet centre? That's a very good question. Um, so yeah, so so we're very keen to understand how, how uh, different growing systems, including the Cravo system, how they perform uh, in a typical UK um, weather during the summer. And so, so we're always looking to extend and expand the remit of the wet centre to include those different growing systems. Um, so, so that's definitely something we're considering and uh, hoping to, uh, to move forward in that direction. OK, so watch this space. Mark, that's all for you for now. Thank you uh, for all your time and presentation this morning. Um, there is Thank another you. question that's come in, but it's not for Mark, it's for John. I, um, John, can you unmute so that we can hear John? Um, and John, the question oh, Scott, for you... Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, okay. The question for you is, uh, when can we expect an EC, pH and temperature probe for the GP2? <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, good, fair question. Um, towards the end of this year, early next year, we'll have an SDI-12 multi-parameter sensor that will do EC, temp and uh, moisture content. Um, performance hopefully similar to the WET2, um, but it'd be buried. Um, that you should be able to put if you really wanted, it being SDI-12 up to about, I imagine, about 55 sensors on one cable going into the uh, GP2. So hopefully that'll be... Um, um, let's just say it starts the new year. Um, what was the other part of that? pH. Um, that would be iron sensing chips, I guess. We have a number of people who've expressed interest to us, researchers who are developing uh, MPK sensors for sort of broad acre agriculture. 
Um, some of them are already using the GP2 for their experiments. Um, uh, we have a, a great distribution, distribution network, so um, if those come to fruition, I mean, we're obviously always interested in those types of projects, but uh, any that come to fruition, we would uh, be very, very keen on. And of course, Mark's just mentioned one uh, for the wet centre, um, well, that he's trialling. Um, I don't know if that would fit to the GP2. It would be great if it would. Things to explore. OK, thank you, John. Um, in the interest of time, we're, time is almost up, so we might better draw this to a close. Um, I'm going to thank all of the presenters this morning. Thank you so much to you. Um, I think your presentation has been very concise and clear, and I do hope that all those who are watching out there have benefited from this this morning. Um, just to wrap up from me, um, please don't forget about your basis neuroso forms. Um, actually, I should just say basis because uh, we don't have any neuroso points so far for this. We have applied, but they haven't come back through yet, but we'll let you know if we do. Um, if you want basis points and you haven't yet applied, um, send the, your, your uh, basis registration number directly to me. Um, and similarly, any further questions which you may have uh, or you may think about in the next 24 hours that you'd like to post to any of our presenters this morning submit to me um, at that email address that's on the screen scott.raffle at ahdb.org.uk and I'll do my best to pass them on and we'll get some answers for, for, from you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, this has been a recorded webinar. Uh, we will be uploading it to our AHDB website uh, in about a week's time. It will go on. Um, if you can't remember that lengthy web address, don't worry. If you just go into Google and search AHDB webinars and, and choose the horticulture uh, picture, you should be able to find this webinar available and waiting for you. Um, there are some other handouts that some of the uh, funders uh, who spoke earlier have provided us with, so we hope those will be available for you to have a look at uh, and download as well. Um, the other thing, just to remind you, and Mark mentioned this earlier, but uh, there are two websites which have lots of information about the Wet Centre. There is the Wet Centre website, official website. Just search on Google for the Wet Centre and you will find it. That's hosted by an IIBMR. The AHDB has a separate page where we have uh, other information, including a number of video clips of Mark talking about some of the work that's going on out in the uh, centre itself. Uh, and uh, other information is uh, useful information on previous results from previous years and the work programme for this year is, is all listed there. So spend a bit of time uh, perusing those when you get a chance. Um, so um, thank you very much for viewing today. Um, do have a look out for other AHDB horticulture webinars. Uh, we will be starting a series of these on a monthly basis. Our first one will be later this month uh, on a range of different topics, uh, which will be of interest to lots of uh, horticultural growers, some of them fruit growers, and we will try and uh, alert you to those, particularly the fruit ones, if you're interested in those. So it remains for me to say thank you once again for listening. Thank you to our speakers. We hope you've enjoyed it. A very good morning to you all.